Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the Washington University amateurs who will be singing the university alma mater. A copy of the lyrics can be found on the back of the convocation program. Please now rise and remove any hats. Ladies and gentlemen, the Washington University amateurs. My name is Lori White, and I am the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs here at Washington University. And it is my great pleasure to welcome the class of 2022. As well as, as well as students joining the classes of 2021 and 2020 as well as exchange students. Welcome to all of you. And to all of the family members who have joined us here today. Now in a former life, I used to be a cheerleader. So I love hearing all the chants and cheers representing the various residential colleges. However, since we're all here to celebrate our newest Washington University Bears, and we are seated in the athletic complex where our 22 national championship banners are flying high, how about we start off this convocation by showing our Wash U spirit. So we're gonna start off with a Go Bears cheer. In this side, you're gonna be Go. This side, you're gonna be Bears. And when I point to your section, at the count of three, I wanna hear really loudly, Go Bears. Y'all got that? All right, let's try it. One, two, three. And those of you who I spot on campus wearing Wash U swag, you'll get a card from me, which is good for a free cup of coffee. And those who I sport on campus wearing swag from another school, well, you just better hope I don't catch you doing that. Now, just three years ago, I too was brand new to Washington University, having joined the university in the summer of 2015. And this year, as I start my fourth year at WashU, I am finally a senior. Though instead of graduating with my class, the class of 2019, I love, yay, 2019! I love it here so much, I think I'll just stay at WashU just a little while longer. 
As the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, my role is to work with my colleagues across the campus community to ensure that your transition to WashU is smooth and seamless. All of us at WashU, your professors, academic advisors, the deans in your schools, coaches, administrators, and staff, RCDs, RAs, and WUSAs, look forward to getting to know each, of every you, each and every one of you by name and by story. And as you begin your life at Washington University, you're going to receive advice from many of us about how to ensure that your time at WashU is successful and that all of you are able to realize your hopes and your dreams for your college education. So my advice is simple. Number one, pursue your passion. Not that kind of passion. You might pursue that here, but that's not my responsibility. I'm talking about pursuing your academic passion. Find a field of study that you're excited about and resolve to put all of your time and energy into being an engaged and intellectually curious student. Secondly, develop a wide circle of friendships while you are here. WashU has students from all across the country and the world, and your education will be enriched by learning something from someone who has grown up in a neighborhood that is different from your own. In fact, I love this quote from a student who said, it is important to value putting in the effort to know someone whose values and experiences are different from yours. If you're stuck in a bubble, there's no room to grow as a person. And finally, keep everything in perspective. I'm reminded of a letter a first-year student wrote to her parents, telling them all about how she broke her leg jumping from a residence hall balcony due to a fire, how she moved in with her boyfriend that was the same age as her parents. And she found a new religion to explore a whole new way of life. Turns out, nothing in the letter was true, but the student had received her first semester grades, which were two A's, a B, and a D and she wanted her parents to keep everything in perspective. Speaking of perspective, as you think about this wonderful college experience on which you are about to embark, keep front of mind that the fundamental purpose of a college education is to expose you to the diversity of ideas. Freedom of expression is an essential component to learning, and all members of our community have the right to speak and express their viewpoint. Protecting one person's right to speak and another's right to disagree is a critically important value of our university. At the same time, know that as a WashU community, we are committed to mutual respect, tolerance, civility, and caring for one another, even when we have differences of opinion or perspective. So as you matriculate into this wonderfully diverse community that is WashU, I hope that you engage in rich debate and dialogue and ask yourself, what can I do to make a difference toward creating a world where every human being feels valued, regardless of race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, nationality, or political perspective. Now, advice aside, my most important role this evening is to recognize those individuals who are most responsible for the planning and implementation of the Bare Beginnings program. So first, the staff of the First Year Center Catherine Pay, Andrea Farnan, Reggie Gackett, and Miranda Kroger. Could you all stand and wave your hands, please? The four of them have worked closely with the first year executive board to plan an amazing Bare Beginnings program for you. 
In the First Year Center, which is located right on the South 40, stands ready to assist you with locating resources, finding opportunities, and connecting you with people, places, and possibilities. And next, I'd like to introduce, as they make their way to the stage, the Student Executive Board. This incredible group of student leaders has worked countless hours to ensure that your welcome to the Washington University community is one that is warm, informative, and fun, and one that sets you up for success as a WashU student. The members of the exec board and the residential and student communities to which each is assigned are going to read their names and also read what they were responsible for or the residential community to which they were assigned. Beth Kaylee Liu and Sarah Chang, you are the SOAR chairs. Stephen Bertelsman, who is the pre-orientation chair. Ben Bridgeforth, holding it down in Lebo. Haley Emerson, holding it down in Wayman Crow. Libby Evan, holding it down in Elliott, Heitzman, Hurd, and Myers. Carter Herscherhorn, Liggett and Koenig. Katherine Ingersoll, transfer and exchange students. Some love for our transfer and exchange students. Lexi Jackson, Umrath and South 40 House. Isabel Shapiro, Park and Mud. Lisa of River Brookings. And Eddie Sheehy, Wiggy, Shanley, Dutton, and Rutledge. Thank you, Exec Board, for all that you do to make their beginnings the memorable beginning that it is. Thank you so much. It is both my privilege and my pleasure to introduce you to your student union president, Grace Ebu. Grace is a senior from Houston, Texas. Anybody from Houston in the house? All right. Grace is a senior from Houston, Texas, majoring in computer science and minoring in psychology. And as your student body president, Grace oversees the undergraduate student government, Student Union. With over 150 officers, Student Union works to allocate $3.4 million to nearly 400 student groups, advocate for student needs, and support student programming on campus. Student Union strives to serve and empower every undergraduate student and to be a force for change and improvement. During her time at Washington University, Grace has been involved in Harambe Christian Ministries, Women in Computer Science, and the Knitting Club, among other things that Grace is involved with. She is also a student technology coordinator in Millbrook and Village East. Outside of Washington University, Grace tutors high school students in the St. Louis area. In this previous summer, she served as a software engineering intern at Facebook. In fact, Grace's claim to fame is that she broke Facebook during her internship experience. Yes, that's right. While exploring Facebook's technology, she inadvertently shut down the whole Facebook system for about an hour. And in the process, Grace learned that failing at something at Facebook does not get you fired, it gets you promoted. WashU was most fortunate to have this outstanding and accomplished leader as the student union president. Please join me in welcoming Grace Abu to the podium. Thank you, Dr. White. Once again, a warm welcome to all the new students as you begin your journey here at WashU. 
I'm honored to be your student body president and to serve as tonight's master of ceremonies. Before I introduce the first speaker, I want to offer you all some advice that has helped me flourish at Wash U, and that is to seek and value the friendships you make here, because those friendships built are going to support you when the going gets rough, be your biggest cheerleaders when you just want to push beyond those limits, and simply be your biggest advocates. Growing up in a family of seven, we had our frequent sibling disagreements. And as such, I always heard my dad say this African adage that has now shaped how I view friendships. And I would encourage you all to take it to heart. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Now together, it is an honor to introduce our first speaker. Mark S. Wrighton assumed the duties of chancellor at Washington University in July of 1995, following over two decades at MIT, where he was professor of chemistry and later provost. Since Mark Wrighton's arrival, Washington University has made unprecedented progress in academic curriculum, campus improvements, resource development, international reputation, and particularly in undergraduate applications and student quality. As some of you may know, Chancellor Wrighton announced his intention to step down as chancellor to the Board of Trustees last year. This 2018 ceremony will be his last convocation as chancellor of Washington University. He has presided over 21 ceremonies during his time here. Tonight, on behalf of the students of Washington University, I would like to present him with this small memento of appreciation. It is a photo from his very first Washington University convocation in 1998. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Chancellor Mark S. Wrighton, the 14th Chancellor of Washington University in St. Louis. Grace, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Our, Our students, students are terrific. terrific. That, that progress, progress that we've, we've made is all about you and those who preceded you. We have had great students, and I declared in a tweet this evening that you are the best. <laughs> welcome to the class of 2022, and welcome our transfer students who are joining us from many other colleges and universities. I also welcome our family and friends of our new students. You're all members now of this great family of Washington University. I know that there are parents, other family members, and friends of our new students watching in the Danforth University Center, Edison Theater, May Auditorium, and Graham Chapel. Thank you for being with us and I look forward to seeing you later in the Brookings Quadrangle. All new students will proceed from here at the Athletic Complex to the Brookings Quadrangle at the conclusion of our program, and we'll look forward to meeting the parents and other family members there. You've already heard from one of our team members, Dr. Lori White. She is Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. She's responsible for everything that you're going to be doing outside your academic experiences. But she herself is a very talented academic. She received a PhD from Stanford University. I'm the chancellor. Some among you may wonder, what does the chancellor do? And when I first came in July of 1995, I looked it up in the dictionary. And it says, among the definitions, secretary, especially secretary to a king. Another definition, titular leader, titular leader of a university. And uh, being a chemist, I looked that up also. And that means figurehead. For example, the Queen of England is the Chancellor 
of the University of London. The definition that, of course, is the truth for us is that the chancellor is the university's chief executive officer. At many other institutions, I'd had the title president. But there is another definition, and it's the one that I like the most. It's doorkeeper. Doorkeeper. My responsibility is to open doors for you, our new students, to open to you the wonderful opportunities that we have here at Washington University. Another great team member is Holden Thorpe. He is our provost. I'm going to introduce him later. But as provost, he's the chief academic officer. And while Dr. White is responsible for everything outside the classroom, Provost Thorpe is responsible for everything inside the academic enterprise. There are many other members of the leadership team here, and they have all contributed to the advance of the university. You see many representatives of the faculty and staff of Washington University. We are wearing, many of us, these beautiful green robes. I have not earned it except by virtue of being chancellor. These are the robes of Washington University. They were designed in the 150th year of the university, in the year 2000, in the academic year 2003-2004. And they were designed by those involved in the fashion design program of the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts. So I am grateful to them. And in just 3.75 years, for those who are entering as first-year students, transfer students a little less, but to parents, our hope is that each student who enters as a first-year student will complete their studies here, earn their degree in 3.75 years, not four years. Remember, we've already passed the summer. 3.75 years, we want 100% graduation rate. Now, the next time that you graduate, next time you gather in the Brookings Quadrangle will be when you're wearing these green robes. So look forward to that. In the meantime, everyone here on stage and all that we represent at the university are here to make this Washington University experience the best college experience possible. Our provost has set out the aspiration that this be the best college in America and indeed the world. So I hope that as you reflect on your experience here and in the not too distant future, you will see this decision you've made to be the best in terms of selecting your college experience. Now in addition to all the team members that we have here contributing to this great place, I also have to tell you that I have a secret weapon. I have my partner, Reese's Whirling. She's here for her 21st, for her 21st convocation as well. And you know, pillow talk, pillow talk really works. If you feel a little reluctant to tell me where we can improve, Share with Risa what should be done, and she will often make sure that it happens. We're wrapping up uh, our orientation program for today with this convocation tonight. As you've learned, this will be my last year as chancellor, and I'm really pleased with a publication that came out about a week and a half ago. It's the Princeton Review. And there have a number of comments there about colleges and universities. And one that brings me a source of pride because we're, you know, re you know they're reflecting on us very positively is we're regarded as the number one of the best run colleges and universities, at least for a year.
Back to Risa for a moment. She created a program called Home Plate. I hope you'll learn about it, and maybe those students who are feeling that they would like a home-cooked meal would be able to participate in the program and not only have a good meal, but have an opportunity to come to know some St. Louisans, perhaps do a little networking, and participate in what's been a great program. Now let me address our new students directly. You've been admitted to Washington University because you have the potential to be leaders in this, the 21st century. Your leadership at Washington University begins tonight. We are experiencing regional, national, and international challenges that we must address together as a community of leaders and learners. You represent a diverse group of exceptionally talented people who have already accomplished a great deal, and you're poised and your position to do so much more. Thank you for making the commitment to be a part of this community and to helping us become a greater university, a university that embraces a commitment to bring benefit to society. You can contribute to the solutions to the complex problems we face, but there may well be disagreement about what constitutes the best solutions and how to implement them. Here at Washington University, you're going to be challenged with opinions, ideas, and proposed actions that run counter to your own views. Indeed, we expect you to be intellectually challenged here. Respectful debate of the issues that confront us and discussion of how best to solve the problems we face should be an important part of your educational experience. My expectation is that we will all remain respectful of one another as we address difficult issues. Many of you will have the opportunity to vote in the midterm elections for members of the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. I encourage those of you who are eligible to register to vote and to exercise your right to participate in our democracy. Our Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement can assist you if you wish to register to vote here in Missouri or in your hometown. As we begin the fall semester, we're going to gather on Monday August 27th at 4 p.m. in Graham Chapel to affirm our community values and commit to achieving social justice and peace. We affirm freedom of speech, and I would also like to affirm freedom of the press, including and in this regard, I have to tell you that student life is an independent, free of the administration organization, and I encourage the freedom of the uh, press for student life as well, even though they're sometimes a little hard on us. I do hope you'll have time and will be willing to participate in that special Monday, August 27th, next Monday session that will take place at 4 o'clock in Graham Chapel. Each of you as new students has my pledge that the administration and faculty will do our best to help you realize your potential and to provide the education you need to be effective leaders. You may well become one of our alumni who won a Nobel Prize. You may become a corporate CEO, a United States Senator, a great artist, and many other areas of accomplishment reflected by our former students, our alumni. You're the next generation of leaders this world needs. Tonight, you can begin asking yourself this important question. What can I do? Your class includes about 1,800 outstanding students selected from the largest applicant pool in our history. You come from 49 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and 21 countries. About two-thirds of you come from greater than 500 miles. We're proud of the diversity you represent in every dimension. 
You've excelled in your lives in many ways, from academics to athletics, from theater to public service. We encourage you to continue the interests you've developed earlier in your lives. Now, I know that there are students here this evening and families from the state of Hawaii. We've had many outstanding students before you from Hawaii. I know that some among you may be troubled by the weather in that part of the world, and we will be thinking of you and your families and hoping for a safe outcome. Now let me speak to the parents. Thank you for supporting your sons and daughters in their decision to attend Washington University. I've heard that some thought it was in Washington, D.C. But we share your interest in having your students enjoy success and happiness, and we are your partners in assisting our students to realize their dreams of a great college experience. Like the students, you are now a part of this community, and we welcome your engagement. I look forward to meeting many of you at the reception that I will host tomorrow afternoon in the Frick Forum in Knight and Bauer Halls of the Olin School of Business. To all of you, the campus is undergoing some important redevelopment. You may have noticed that. East of Brookings Hall, we will have, by May 10th, an 800-car underground parking garage, the Summers Welcome Center, the Schnook Pavilion for Dining and Sustainability Programs, Weil Hall for the Fox School of Design and Visual Arts, Jubal Hall for Mechanical Engineering and Material Science, and expen expanded Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, re-landscaping, and next month, we're going to start McKelvey Hall for computer science and computer engineering. All the projects except McKelvey Hall will be done by the end of April, that is by the material completion date of May 10th, except for McKelvey Hall, which will be finished in the fall of 2020. When this project is complete, the campus will be safer, far more attractive, and have expanded academic facilities. I beg your patience as the campus improvements take place. All of you will have the enjoyment of a far more attractive front entrance to Washington University in nine months. Back to the students. You'll have many academic opportunities here, but you'll also have many other activities, including athletics, seminars, performances, and social events. There are more than 400 student groups, and I encourage you to become involved. But these are going to require a commitment of time. For all of us, we only have 24 hours in a day. But then there are nights. And I suspect that some of our students are going to discover that they need those nights. One of your biggest challenges will be time management. But with respect to how you spend your time, things have changed dramatically starting tonight. Just a few months ago, most of you were in high school with a relatively structured and controlled schedule. Tonight, you begin a new phase of your life with more independence and freedom, but with that freedom become, comes more responsibility. Beginning immediately, you will have many choices to make. We are confident you can do well and be successful, but realize that your success will depend on making good decisions. Your new freedom means you are no longer under anyone's supervision. Your parents are no longer directly responsible for you, except for the tuition payments, please. <laughs> You have responsibility for yourself. There will be no one to tell you when to go to bed or, when, or whether to get up. No one to tell you to make your bed. No one to tell you what to eat. No one to govern your comings and goings. You'll be the one to decide who your friends will be and whether to join a Greek organization. And you'll be the judge of when and whether 
to accept advice from others. You should enjoy your new independence. But as I mentioned, there are also important responsibilities beyond those to yourself. You remain responsible to those who've made it possible for you to be here, your parents, other family members, teachers, coaches, religious leaders, and your friends. The excellence of students and faculty of the university define us. For many, this may be the first time you've been surrounded by so many high achievers like yourself. In these early days, you may be intimidated by the fact that your classmates are as smart and as accomplished in their area of interest as you are in yours. I believe those feelings are natural, but you will soon find that you are not in comp competition with your classmates. Your own goals should be your guideposts. As I conclude my remarks, I want to give you some important advice. Number one, number one, go to class. You or your parents, you or your parents are paying a great deal for you to have the opportunity to be here. Take full advantage of your educational program. Number two, do not abuse alcohol or other drugs. The legal age, the legal age for drinking in Missouri is 21 years. None of us can exercise good judgment when intoxicated, and we know that alcohol abuse is associated with adverse consequences academically and is, an, is a factor in greater than 90% of campus crime. Most of your peers are making wise choices about alcohol, and the vast majority of our students drink moderately, if at all. Students, I challenge you to make wise choices during your college years. Make decisions that will have a positive impact on you personally and on the university community. You have my wish and my support for your success here at Washington University. You're beginning as first year students while I'm beginning my last year as chancellor. My successor is a distinguished individual who's already been named, Dr. Andrew Martin. He is an alumnus of Washington University, earning, having earned a PhD in political science. And he is a former faculty member here who served with distinction as an academic leader most recently at the University of Michigan. Andrew Martin and I are both privileged to serve here as chancellor. Andrew Martin is here. I think he's in the back, and I'd like him to stand and receive our recognition as chancellor-elect. Now to the students. I look forward to seeing you successful, and I look forward to seeing our new chancellor having great success in the years ahead. Thank you all. I mentioned that we are partnered with our parents. And this evening, we have two of our outstanding parent leaders with us, individuals who've become very engaged with us through our Parents' Advisory Council. They are Jacqueline and John Buxbaum. They are the Parents' Council co-chairs. They are from Chicago, Illinois. They have two sons. Their eldest is Max, and he's a senior in the College of Arts and Sciences, pursuing a major in psychological and brain sciences. Jacqueline and John have been actively involved with the university community since Max arrived on campus three years ago. Last year, they served as our parents' fund co-chairs. They have hosted events, participating in the Washington University of Chicago Network, and they have made welcoming phone calls to our new families, and they have invested in opportunities that enrich the student life experience. 
They graciously agreed to serve as chairs this year for the Parents' Council. They are here this evening, and I'd like to invite forward both Jacqueline and John Buxbaum for some interesting comments to our audience. Please welcome the Buxbaums. Good evening. On behalf of the WashU parent community, Jackie and I would like to welcome all the parents to tonight's convocation. WashU is an amazing place, and you and us are the proud parents of arguably the most talented, ambitious, and passionate students in the country. In our role as parents, we are here to support our students as they grow emotionally, intellectually, socially, and academically. Learning comes in many forms and experiences at WashU, or comes in many forms, and the experience at WashU is not limited to the classroom. We as parents must recognize the full experience we want our students to engage in. In many ways, this is not new news or a new responsibility for us as parents, but from now on, this support will come from more of a geographical distance. The best guidance Jackie and I can offer to all of the parents here tonight, whether you're here for the first time or as a repeat parent, is to stay calm, take a deep breath, and have faith in the wonderful young adults that you have raised. They will make new friends. They will find their way around campus. They will figure out how to share a room or a suite with others. And we promise they will thrive in the Wash U environment. While John is here to offer recommendations to the parents, I would like to share my thoughts with you, the incoming class. College is a great opportunity to make lifetime relationships, so build your network. These relationships can be both your peers and your professors. Even though I graduated over 30 years ago, I am still in regular contact with one of my professors. Today, more than ever, we live in a world of collaboration. Reach out to your professor and get to know them. Let them become a mentor and a friend to you. These sort of things will vastly enrich your college experience. Never feel that you cannot ask for help, whether it's in the classroom or outside the classroom. We all find ourselves in moments of need. If you think you need help, don't be afraid to ask. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's actually a show of strength. Here are a few other tips I can offer you. Show up. 80% of success is simply showing up. Be an upstander, not a bystander. Be yourself. Be authentic. Who you are is plenty good. Be safe and be smart in your thinking. Mistakes are a part of life. If you never fail, you most likely will have never tried something outside of your comfort zone. The worst that will happen is that you will learn from your failures. And isn't that why you're here? To learn? Build yourself and not your resume. Lastly, and most importantly, don't forget to call your mother. Jackie and I have found certain things helpful in the college experience. One of the best things that we have found is for us to stay in touch with campus. Just as Jackie reminded the students to call home, we as parents need to check in with the school as well. 
Make sure WashU has your email addresses. Parents Programs wants to stay in touch anytime there is an important announcement, be it safety or anything else that might arise. If you are anything like us, you will both want to have your emails on file. Email is how the university communicates with parents and sends important notifications. The Parents Calendar provides a month-to-month -month overview of what is happening on campus. Sign up for the quarterly Parents e-newsletter, Family Ties. Take advantage of the orientation events this weekend. Come back for Parent and Family Weekend in October. Not only is it a beautiful time to be on campus, but I suspect both mom, dad, and son or daughter will delight in the visit. Jackie and I are here speaking to you tonight because we chose to become involved with our student school. Just in the same way that we chose to be involved in his elementary, middle, and high school years, yes, it was Jackie more than me, but I appreciated the fact that she was so passionate, interested, and determined to make our son's experience even better from what was already a top flight institution. We hope you will consider how you would like to become involved and make WashU better than it already is. Yes, the bar is high, but you have raised terrific kids and you can now parlay your abilities into making WashU even better for everyone who is a part of this wonderful university. There are many ways that WashU partners with parents. Your time and expertise could benefit some of our students. If you know someone, or if you or someone you know can provide student internships or jobs, please communicate this to the Career Center. Volunteer to help recruit prospective students and make welcome calls to next year's class of 2023 new parents. If you receive an invitation to a Washington University in your, in your hometown, we hope that you will attend. Look around. Your student isn't alone at WashU. This is the right time and place to let go. These outstanding students are beginning their, this journey together. They share the same excitement, sense of adventure, and unlimited opportunity Remember when some of you were preparing for freshman year? The upperclassmen will embrace them and help them find their way. And as you will discover, this university is absolutely committed to providing its students with resources and support they need to succeed. Lastly, we want to extend a warm welcome to the WashU parent community. Welcome to the WashU family. It is now an honor to introduce our student keynote speaker. Dan Sikorsky is a senior majoring in political science in the College of Arts and Sciences. Originally from Argentina, he immigrated to Miami, Florida when he was five years old. Dan's passions lie in writing, teaching, ethics, and the power of creative forms to change lives. A former WUSA for Elliott, Dan is also a Rodriguez Scholar and a Gephardt Institute Civic Scholar. He has been the Editor-in-Chief of the Washington University Political Review and an Editorial Intern at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He also served as an Associate Justice on Student Union's Constitutional Council, portrayed both John F. Kennedy and a sheep in Student Media, and worked as a peer tutor at the Writing Center. Dan is slightly jet-lagged and fresh on arrival from Morocco, where he lived this summer while completing a State Department internship at the U.S. Embassy in Rabat. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dan Sikorsky. Hi. I am deeply honored and also a little bit scared to speak with you tonight. 
Thank you for having me here, and thank you for your patience as I begin, but also promise not to end on a somber note. I didn't feel too well on my own convocation three years ago, sitting where you are sitting right now. Convocation fell on my birthday of all days. Instead of celebrating with my family and friends in the comfort of my hometown, I was in a very unknown place swarmed by new people. Once it was all over, once I had cheered my throat away and exhausted my introverted self, I returned to my Rutledge dorm room. All my new sweet mates were still out celebrating and the room was empty and quiet. I laid down on the common room couch, hugged my knees and closed my eyes. I cried. I cried because I missed my traditional Argentine birthday cake. I cried because I've had enough over the past few days of feeling like capitalism's victim at Bed Bath & Beyond. I also cried because I could tell one of my roommates did not flush the toilet. But mostly, mostly, I cried because I was overwhelmed by a feeling of unprecedented loneliness and independence. It's that feeling that I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about, about, I want to talk about how we can have confidence, knowing that we control our own lives, and more specifically, about how we can grow comfortable during college, but also after, with being off path and unanchored. This advice will be for you as much as it will also be for me, because there are times I could also still use it. I wager that despite all the accompaniment and support tonight, despite all the advice you've already received, a lot of you also feel like you're on your own. You must realize that once your parents leave, a frightening load of responsibilities will fall to you. What you eat and whether you exercise, how you shape your daily schedule, which classes you take and who you befriend, what you do with all your time and what you do with your life. All of it will be up to you. The world for you right now is enormous. Some of you, more than others, have actually been craving this independence, I know. Part of me was too. But part of you is probably also scared. And as you should be, we're social animals, all of us. We can't believe our futures are up to us, us tiny and four-limbed, temperamental mammals. Everyone here, your RAs and WUSAs, your professors, your parents and the campus leaders on this stage, everyone fears treading alone at one point or another, no matter their air of confidence. Long ago, humans lived tribally because packs promised resources and power, security, have we really changed all that much? Today, we call ourselves Cincinnatians and Cubs fans, doctors and bankers, Hispanic, biology majors, names, titles, and identities that deliver us security in numbers. It's a big, turbulent world out there, and sometimes it feels like we're drowning in a decade of especially rough waters, politically, economically, and environmentally. And so, of course, we dash for the few life jackets gathered about. We want to feel accompanied and safe, grounded. On my convocation night, I feared the boundless agency to do and be whatever I wanted. The entire world felt open, and among millions of next moves, I didn't know which I would choose. This indecision didn't exactly resolve itself. As a senior, I'm often asked, what's next? I don't know what's next. I have no next step. I'm torn choosing in between a high-paying but mind-numbing job and a career as a writer or a teacher, jobs I know I'd love but that might find me financially unstable. I can't tell you what's next, nor can I tell my mom, her friends, nor any of the absolute strangers who love to ask. All I can tell anyone is that I have a more general idea of what I'm after. I seek to live a full and happy life, one spent learning forever, 
developing relationships with others and one with myself too. Living worldwide, building a family, helping those in need and producing things, be they books or school lessons, vegetables even, that make me smile. That's the life I like. And it unnerved me during convocation, just as it has on many nights since, that none of that dream can be guaranteed by a major, nor a career, nor a profession. There is no surefire way I can make it. It's just me determining whether I succeed, whether I screw up, whether I give up or settle for less. I don't like how accountable and alone, how responsible this makes me feel. Every time our world grows bigger, it's tempting to want to make it smaller. Because sometimes we don't trust ourselves with so much responsibility, we follow tried and true paths that will most likely guarantee us jobs and money, success. It's comfortable. It's why in college, students often latch on to a major or cling to a group of friends, pledge loyalty to a fraternity or sorority or student organization. These bases have long defined successful college students and they make us feel like we're on some path, any path. By all means, I want you to go ahead and absolutely make friends and join these groups. They will fill you with community and love. But do consider this, college is not a place where you should always feel on track. At this university and during your time on this earth, I encourage you to follow you and your heart above all else. I mean that because no freedom is greater than that of commanding your own days. So be original. Individuals strong enough to design their lives as original compositions and not as presets relish that they answer not to the routine, but to themselves. Now, I absolutely agree with you that that's uncomfortable and scary. The truth is that most of us are not naturally confident and strong enough to take big risks. Endurance is an ability we must develop strenuously and not without a good deal of self-doubt. Often it feels easier to just make safe decisions, to go down well-established roads that have already worked for other people. Whether that's actually, in fact, the smarter alternative, I, I can't say. I'm 21 and not 81. I don't know what works out best in the end. But I refuse to believe, and I think you would too, that wealth and fame and career success are the most important goals worth fighting for. Of course, we should be ambitious and seek professional success. We just shouldn't focus only on that. I think you should decide for yourself what to seek. Health, justice, Love, happiness or self-respect, passion. I think these should be our priorities. I believe passion matters because each of you has your own aspirations. Otherwise, you would not be here at an internationally renowned university. During college and also after it, you're seeking the highly personalized dreams in your head. To arrive at that original dream, you'll often have to take unfamiliar and risky steps. Think about it. You wouldn't go look up a recipe for a brand new dish that you imagined yourself. No one's made the dish before. Any recipe you find online might get close, but it'll only be an approximation at best. It couldn't possibly taste like what you imagined, could it? I personally dream of being a writer. I knew this more than ever at 5.30 a.m. on October 13, 2015, when I found myself in Olden Library, joyously typing up a recap of the Democrats' first primary debate. I had a French midterm the next morning, but there I was, doing what I loved, not noticing my latte getting cold or the sun rising. Maybe you've felt that feeling before. The clock stops ticking, your eyes stop wandering, you neglect your phone and nothing distracts you. The whole world belongs to you and your task. Think back to the last time you felt this way. What were you doing? 
Were you teaching school children or coding computer language? Maybe you were advocating for a cause you really believe in. Maybe you were learning chemistry, in which case I really don't understand you, but that's the point. You are the one who's felt that passion, that sense of knowing that this, this is me. None of this is a multiple choice question, and you have no obligation to choose among the provided answers. You can forego pre-made paths, make of your life what you want, wherever you want, and however you want. Imagine that. Imagine following you above all else. It's tempting, I know, to silence the idealistic voice within us. And it's tough to develop the confidence to pursue what we really want. But tonight is your warm welcome to college, one of the most comfortable and encouraging settings to explore, make mistakes, and question what matters to you. Tonight is also your induction into none other than Wash U, an institution whose communities and support systems are especially determined and prepared, if you let them, to help you arrive at your unique definition of your path. Because that's no easy task, I might offer some tips to help along the way. One, don't rush to closure. Try new clubs and activities, and accept that it might be three years before you meet your lifelong friends. Take random classes in new departments, and please don't wedge yourself to a major. I admire the undecided. It's what we should all be when you think about it. Because even if we have a major or a career already, it's never too late to start again or turn around. Should you decide today or 30 years from now to become a doctor or a farmer, physicist or artist, you could find a way. Good things, among them refined taste, come to those who wait. Two. Align your time and your values. You will perform best when your responsibilities harmonize with your priorities. When all my friends rushed Greek life, I, very much not a frat boy, thought I should too. I accepted a bid only to drop it a full three days later because I had joined a group that was not me. Remember to ask yourself often if you're doing things for a right reason. It looks good on a resume should rarely suffice. Three, reflect constantly. Your mind will always be by your side, and it's darn important you develop a good relationship with it. So speak with and listen to yourself. Take long walks, lay on the grass, or listen to music with closed eyes. It's in those meditative and contemplative moments that you'll find some clarity. And four, remember that you have many cheerleaders, close friends and parents, professors and staff, all are invested in you. Talk with them and phone home. I learned the value of support once I got through crying on my own convocation night. Sweat and tears had smudged my face paint, but I walked with another Rodriguez scholar to dinner. Waiting for me at BD were 50 people I had only just met, ready with a cookie cake and the most sweet-sounding birthday greeting I've ever received. There is more virtue than shame in a good cry, but you don't, need to wait until, you don't need to wait until you reach tears to seek support from campus institutions and the people who love you. To recap, I trust that if you, one, allow yourself to not have all the answers, two, hold yourself to fill in your time with involvements that ring true, three, think and reflect and dream, and four, keep close your supporters you will move toward the life you desire confidently and with grace. Before I end, I wanted to also make an entreaty. Your freedom to pursue your dreams is scary, empowering, and unanchoring, but above all, it is a privilege. You must realize that 93% of the world has not and will not attend college. As you consider your extracurriculars and St. Louis involvements, as you go through your daily interactions with everyone from cashiers to, to that old goof at the baseball game, remember your privilege. The whole world is open to you, but it is not for someone who doesn't have enough to eat, someone living under authoritarianism, someone homeless or hungry, someone bankrupt or without any degree. 
Those of us here tonight have a civic duty to help create, in our own ways, a world in which everyone has the freedom to dream, move, and live however they desire. Today, when I doubt myself and my priorities, when competition and fears derail me, I travel back to a song my parents taught me when I was four years old. Microphone in my tiny hand, I used to stand on a kitchen stool and sing. Pintarse la cara, color esperanza, tentar al futuro con el corazón. Paint your face with the color of hope and seek the future with your heart. We're all here because we do dream. We do aim high and we do think about what will bring us happiness and love and joy. We demand of ourselves that our days be our dreams and our dreams be our days. Welcome to college and welcome to Washington University, a place where if you regard unfamiliar roads less as dangerous to avoid and more as liberating lifestyles to pursue, you will live both the present and the future you imagine. Thank you. Dan, thank you very much. You can now understand why I'm so proud of our students and we can declare them the best. As a token of appreciation for Dan's contribution and graces, I'm going to present each of them with the university ring. The ring is a symbol of the tradition of excellence that Washington University represents. At the center of the ring is the official shield of Washington University. Grace and Dan, would you come forward so that I can present you with this memento. It is now my pleasure to formally introduce our provost, Dr. Holden Thorpe. I've shared with you already that he is the chief academic officer, but what does the provost really do? Well, he does everything that you think I do. He's been a distinguished academic leader for many years prior to joining Washington University. He served as a distinguished academic and researcher at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. At UNC, he served as a faculty member in chemistry, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and as chancellor for the five years preceding his appointment as our provost. He joined us a little over five years ago and holds a faculty appointment in both medicine and chemistry, and he holds the Rita Levy Montalcini Distinguished University Professorship. This professorship was established to honor a woman who served on our faculty and received the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. Please join me in welcoming Provost Holden Thorpe. Thank you, Chancellor, and hello, Mayors. Let's hear it for Dan, everybody. How about that great talk? As the Chancellor said, I'm Holden Thorpe, and I'm the Provost of the University. If you still don't know what a Provost is, if you're a Harry Potter fan, just think of me as Professor McGonagall. Our goal is for Washington University to be the best place to go to college in America, and to reach that goal, we need to know when you see something that we could do better. When you see something that isn't quite right, let us know. You can reach me by email if you're digitally nostalgic. Or you can reach me directly on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. 
or you can snap one of my kids and tell them that you want to talk to me. Now, before I introduce our speaker, I, want, I have two pieces of advice for the students. The first is, we have a great admissions director. She did not make a mistake when she admitted you. Every single one of you belongs here and has what it takes to achieve your dreams. And if you're nervous about your academic work, remember that even though we all look all official up here with our robes and our stripes and these ridiculous hats, <laughs> We were all nervous the first week of college, too. Now, the second piece of advice is that I want you to be amazed. Amazed that Rosalind Franklin took a picture of DNA that changed the world. Amazed that Martin Luther King Jr. could write and speak so timelessly and powerfully, even though he was abused, imprisoned, and eventually murdered. Amazed that William Inge and Tennessee Williams, two of our greatest playwrights born here, right here in St. Louis, could create a new American language. And amazed that Miles Davis, who was born just across the river in Alton, Illinois, used music to show us our souls. Now, speaking of music, get ready to hear from one of the very best, a great musician and a great scholar. Todd Decker is professor and chair of the Department of Music. He is an expert on commercial popular music in the United States from the 1920s to the present, including music for Broadway, Holiday, Hollywood film, television, and jazz. He teaches and writes on a wide range of themes within these larger areas of interest, such as combat music for movies about the Vietnam War, who should be allowed to sing Old Man River and the issue of race in the American musical, Fred Astaire and the Gershwin Brothers. His recent writings include the use of disco in the film The Martian. I'm waiting for his analysis of similar music in the Americans and Guardians of the Galaxy. He is also a great piano player, and I know because I've been lucky enough to do some gigs with him. Please give a warm washy welcome to my colleague and friend, Todd Decker. Thank you, Holden, and welcome, Class of 2022. You are, of course, the focus tonight, seated together in the center, surrounded by your parents and family and friends in the mezzanine and your faculty and administration on the platform. I find myself potentially sitting in two places tonight, for I am a member of the faculty, but I am also the proud father of a member of the class of 2022. So I volunteered to give this keynote, and Chancellor Wrighton was kind enough to take a chance on me, because I knew that if I sat in the mezzanine with the parents, my eyes would mysteriously water through the entire ceremony. So I figured it was safer to be up here and to literally wear my ridiculous professor hat. Today, most of you moved into your residence halls. It's not yet home nor could you credibly say you found that thing called family here at WashU. So this is a delicate moment. Tonight, WashU officially takes custody of you. We hope to be something of a new home and family. Think for a moment about the two families in the hall tonight, the real one that helped you get here, and the potential WashU family beside you in colored t-shirts and staring you down up here in our grand academic regalia. One of the best things about being a professor is the constant exposure to young people. In the university family, the freshman class is always 18 years old. The rest of us get older, but the freshman class stays forever the same age. This is not, of course, how it works for children and their parents. Children get older and they eventually stop being children at all. As parents, we rejoice to see you here, and we are sad to see the most intense years with you come to an end. But as faculty, 
We are glad to greet once again a group of new young minds and hearts. We are excited to watch you grow, and I will admit, we want something from you. To understand what we want from you, you need to understand what we, your professors, do. To borrow a phrase from a colleague of mine, we are here to make permanent new knowledge. Each of us does this in different ways, but fundamentally that's who we are people in pursuit of new knowledge that will stand the test of time. No one makes permanent knowledge by themselves. Each of your professors is part of a conversation that began before we arrive and will go on after we're gone. These conversations extend beyond this campus, crossing our nation and circling the planet. The conversations your professors engage in are defined by our disciplines. My discipline is musicology. I am a musicologist or a music historian who studies popular music and film music. I know, it sounds like a great job. I have colleagues across the country and around the world who also work on popular music and film music. We read and critique and praise each other's work. We meet regularly in person to exchange ideas and eat and drink together. Each of us served long apprenticeships in our disciplines and our professional lives are devoted to participating in the scholarly conversation that defines our chosen area of interest. Some of us work to transform that conversation, to fundamentally change the subject, to take our disciplines in new directions. Some of your professors are revolutionaries. They were there at the moment when a whole new conversation began. So, a class with me or with any of my colleagues offers an entry into one of these scholarly conversations, which are larger than any of us and bigger than this place. By design, your course of study will bring you into a variety of these conversations. When you declare a major or a minor, you in effect join a conversation. Now some scholarly conversations might initially seem strange. Follow where they lead and you could end up in what feels like a whole new world. I hope you take at least one course here that regularly just blows your freaking mind. And while every scholarly conversation has its quirks, I'd like to offer you three general guidelines for dealing with professors and their disciplines, three principles for joining us in our conversations. First, scholarly conversations are tough. Imagine a circle of smart people all trying to prove how smart they are. Now that is all to the good, because you came here to be surrounded by smart people, and you got in here by being a smart person. But smart folks know something. They have knowledge. When your task is to make permanent new knowledge, what you need is new evidence. Learning what counts as evidence is crucial, because it varies from discipline to discipline. We, your professors, are here to show you how evidence works in our specific fields and to model thinking through questions in a way that leads to answers that will stand the test of the conversation. None of us just make stuff up, mostly because the rigor of the scholarly conversation that tests our ideas will call us out in a second. We are here to help you learn to express your ideas and your ideals by way of evidence, because that is the only way any serious person will lend an ear to what you have to say. Evidence, of course, is only as good as how it's presented. So, and here I'm going to get very practical, hone your writing and rehearse your oral presentations well before the due date. My mentor, Richard Crawford, at the University of Michigan, used to say, there are no ideas without sentences. In other words, start writing now. My deadly serious advice to you is this. Don't start making sentences the night before the papers do. Open a new document a week before the due date and just make a sentence. Once you make a sentence, then you are in the real business of writing, which is rewriting. And don't feel alone in this. All of your professors are writers too. Now evidence can be a squirrely thing. You're going to have to look for it or generate it, and what you find in your research or produce in the lab won't necessarily move you smoothly down whatever path you thought you were heading. Be resilient. 
be ready to deal with adverse data or information, especially when that evidence calls into question what you already think you know. Be prepared to change your mind. It's something a good scholar does all the time. Now, I've painted scholarly conversations as combative, and sometimes they are. And that is all to the good, because ideas matter. But the best scholarly conversations are marked by courtesy, my second guideline for negotiating this house of learning. You arrive today at a place where we will insist on respect for all, even and especially at the heart of what we do, the making of permanent new knowledge. Courtesy is a strong, and these days, truly radical principle of human interaction. Courtesy counts because most Courtesy counts because most of what we do here, we are going to do face to face. You joined us on this campus so that we can talk to you in person. The heart of courtesy is attending to the words of others, listening and responding thoughtfully. Beyond such courtesy and scholarly talk lies courtesy in the public sphere, where the fate of democracy itself rests on how well we talk and listen to each other. Beyond any permanent new knowledge we make here, this place exists to make people who will shape the national and global conversation for the good of all. You are those people on whom the hope of the future rests. A third guideline. We, your professors, are going to assume you are curious because we hope we are. Now, when you're in a class with us, we obviously will have an advantage. We are passionate about our work. Passion for a specific area of knowledge fuels our every word and thought. And the stakes for us in our scholarly conversation are incredibly high. Each of you are passionate as well, hopefully about a set of ideas and ideals. Some, of, some classes will fit right into those passions. Others won't. But all your professors will want passionate engagement from their students. I encourage you to bring a passionate mind and heart to all your courses, an attitude that the content of the course matters, but perhaps more crucially, that the experience of being in the class matters. In four years at this place, you will take a seat in about 40 different courses, each course gathering together a group of people representing a more or less diverse microcosm of humanity. You'll spend about 40 hours in each course with those people, sequestered with those other human souls conversing over a defined body of knowledge. The members of these isolated and artificial groups of humans must somehow learn to talk to, listen to, respect, and challenge each other, all while engaging in the quest for permanent new knowledge. Because, my friends, the permanent new knowledge that you are here to make is you. The permanent new knowledge you make will be the you that is formed by this place, formed in the experiences you have here, talking and listening, writing and speaking, respecting and hopefully eventually loving those around you. Now, I said earlier that your professors want something from you, and I'll tell you now what it is. We want you to join our scholarly conversations and to grow into people with whom we can share the ideas and ideals that matter to us. The greatest pleasure in teaching comes from watching a student make their way towards full participation in a scholarly conversation, to witness you becoming our colleagues. This happens over weeks and months and years, and we will be here for the long haul. During your years here making permanent new knowledge with us, we will assume you are ready to learn new things because we hope we are, and we want to learn from you in the conversations we share. We will assume you are ready to think closely, critically, carefully, and recklessly, and that you'll learn with us when each of these ways of thinking works towards a given goal. And we will hope that the conversations shared in this place serve as models for how for how to interact with others when the time comes for you to leave us. Because as much as the next four years in this place are all about you, 
Make no mistake. We are doing this to change the world. Your professors work to shape their respective scholarly conversations and hope to also influence the public sphere in different ways as each of us can. Teaching you is one very active way we do this. Most of you will not remain in the world of the academy. You will, however, take the values and skills, the ideas and ideals you acquire here out into the world. We fervently hope that the permanent new knowledge represented by each of you will go out from this place and transform our world for the good of all, insisting that evidence support every argument, treating everyone you encounter with courtesy, and engaging the world with passion. Good luck, be safe, and we look forward to seeing you in class. Thank you, Thank you, Professor, Professor Decker. Decker. As, As you, you now know, know this, this is a research, research university where learning and discovery are both vital. Here you receive, you receive the gift of knowledge, and it is my hope that Washington University will illuminate the truth for you and light your path through life. To symbolize your illuminated path through your life to this point, your parents will now be asked to leave and literally light your path to the Brookings Quadrangle. The students will then follow the stage principles to the Quadrangle, where we're all going to enjoy Ted Drew's frozen custard and Professor Decker will be listening to music. Parents will find their students in the Quadrangle and the next, the next time this class gathers in the quadrangle will be for their commencement. Would the students please remain seated while the parents depart this venue?
gathering and to our new students before you know it you're going to be graduates of Washington University I'm here to assure you that the time passes quickly I just took a look at the beautiful photograph that Grace presented to me and I preceded in that photo just in the way that I did this evening in 1998. But as Professor Decker noted, you know, we're getting older and the students look the same. In that photograph, I look more similar to you than I do now. But we've had many great graduates and you're going to join an alumni group that now is greater than 130,000 around the world. Tonight, we have the chair of the Alumni Board of Governors with us. He's going to speak briefly. His name is Neil Yaris. He received a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the Olin School in 1986. He served in numerous volunteer roles and now serves as chair of the Alumni Board of Governors and in this capacity, he's a member of the Board of Trustees. He lives in New Jersey. After spending 29 years as a bond trader, he now dedicates his time to volunteering for Washington University and other important endeavors. Neil and his wife, Jane, are the parents of two alumni of the university, and their daughter, Anna, Annie, is currently a junior here at Washington University. Please join me in welcoming Neil Yaris. I promise to go quickly, otherwise the ice cream will melt. On behalf of the Alumni Association, it's my pleasure to welcome the newest members of our Washington University community to the class of 2022, to our transfer students, and to all future alumni, welcome. This weekend marks the beginning of an incredibly exciting new chapter for all of you. The time you spend here will likely have a profound effect on the rest of your lives. The people you meet, the courses you take, and the experiences you have, both here in St. Louis and abroad, will help you grow in so many ways. 36 years ago, I sat where you sit today. Then, after four years studying accounting and finance at the Olin School, I began a career in bond trading with my first job at Goldman Sachs. If not for my experiences at WashU and the diploma I held in my hand, I would never have gotten that chance. To this day, I'm grateful to this university for all that it has done for me. Personally, I think you are amongst the luckiest people to be able to spend the next few years at WashU. I hope your relationship with the university continues throughout your lifetime. You now have the support of over 130,000 alumni spread all over the world, and I encourage you to use them as resources during your years here and after you graduate. In addition, I hope you will continue the tradition of giving back to future generations of Washington students. Many of you have received financial aid or scholarships, that money comes from many sources, one of which is donations from alumni 
who want to give young people the same great opportunity they received years before. I know how this feels, as I would not have been able to attend WashU if not for the generosity of alumnus Sidney Guller and his wife Bobby. As a recipient of their scholarship, I was able to pursue my dreams. Tonight, I have the honor of presenting a special gift to the class of 2022, your own class banner. As you exit this evening, you will fall behind it, and for the first time, as a class, on your way to Brooklyn's Quad. We have it coming out now. I would like to ask Kevin Toledo to come to the stage to receive the class banner. As you may know, Kevin was the winner of the Class of 2022 Logo Design Contest. He is joined on stage by his classmate. He's joined on stage and is uh, stage by his classmate, Maddie Chu. Kevin is from Los Angeles and will be living in Liga Koenig Residential College. And Maddie is from Pasadena and will be living in the William Greenleaf Elliott Residential College. <laughs> Congratulations, Kevin, for your wonderful design. And we're fortunate to have someone as talented as you at the university. Uh, beautiful, beautiful design. Kevin and Maddie, as you head to the Brookings Quad, I hope you carry this banner proudly and think about the remarkable journey you are beginning. You came in with your parents, but you will leave with your classmates. Whenever you get together as a class, this banner will be there, whether at commencement or at reunions in years to come. And hopefully, you will all remember tonight as a very special beginning. To have come here tonight means that you are amongst the most impressive students of your generation. Each of you was carefully selected from over 30,000 applicants. We consider ourselves lucky to have each and every one of you join the Washington University family. Again, on behalf of the Alumni Association, welcome, and we wish you all the best that the WashU community has to offer. Okay, I am told we're ready. Now, before you leave, the uh, individuals who've been helping so effectively, the WUSAs and our RAs, they're gonna help us leave and we'll go to the quadrangle. But before you do, for those who are seated in the chairs, for a small number of you, there might be an envelope under your chair. Check in there, and that's an invitation. That's an invitation to a bowling party at my residence. Yes, the Chancellor's residence has a bowling alley. My wife and I look forward to receiving the winners on Monday, August 27th at 6 o'clock. Now the Wusas will assist you. Please remain seated until the stage principals have recessed. I'll look forward to receiving you in the quadrangle. Professor Decker and I will be carrying the torch of knowledge, and we will look forward to seeing you for Ted Drew's ice cream. Music, please.